my friend John. John and I grew up together here in India. We were the twin heads of the brat pack, and there was no mischief under the sun we hadn't got up to, until my parents yanked hard on the reins and hauled me in, kicking and screaming. Fortunately, I discovered a knack for studying, and that juggernaut developed its own momentum, seeing me through a fairly distinguished career. John's family emigrated to Australia. The international post, not email in those days, cost too much even with copy paper, and those red and blue diagonally border-striped par avion envelopes, and we were too young, and we lost touch. I can't think how I came across his email address a few months ago, but we connected again and have been toing and froing since then. Yesterday, I got a message from. But I'm putting the cart before the horse. Let me share some of his letters with you. I think you'll get the drift. George Mann, this was one of his early ones. I'm always happy to receive your emails, so stop the blasted apologizing. Whether they are too frequent or not frequent enough is irrelevant. And the only thing that irritates is your constant apologizing. So quit it already. I remember your brother and sister, but all of you seem to have had lots of kids, and they've had lots of kids. So it's quite a merry bunch in those family photos. If my old mum had heard me say that, I'd have earned myself the pasting of my life, attracting the evil eye on you. She'd have said. Even Sylvie, my wife, says it's bad form. She's born and brought up here in sunny Sydney, never seen the shores of India. But honestly, sometimes she's just like my mum. Sylvie always wanted a large family, so though that wouldn't have been my choice, we had four: two boys and two girls. You were asking about my sister. But I'm not much in touch with Jennifer anymore. She went off to Perth, and it's right across the country. And somehow we've just drifted apart after the old folks passed on. People don't realize how large Australia is. It's a five-hour flight from Sydney to Perth. That's halfway from Bombay to London, which is probably what you understand. She has two little girls, perhaps not so little anymore, but I still see them in their knee socks. Our youngest, Robin, is mastering in marine biology. She's a clever thing and earned herself a scholarship and all, but it's still a pretty packet. No need to tell you that education is always a thing to invest in. Robin used to be interested in the slimy stuff from the sea, even when they were just kids. She would root through the little pools left behind by the tide and tell us the life stories of all the creepy crawlies. I'd nod off after a bit, but Sylvie has the patience of Job. Must come of her being a teacher herself, though now she's retired, of course. John Junior has just dropped in, so I'll sign off now and keep the family saga coming in installments. Write whenever you can, but cut the carping on bothering me, or I'll just have to take the slow boat back to India and beat it out of you myself. Cheers, John. I kept the ball aloft from my end, updating John about my family. He was right; we were big on education, and we counted many professors, doctors, and engineers amongst our number. Nowadays, the kids wanted to study strange things like sports medicine or airport management. But truth be told, I'm just glad it's still medicine and management. Call me old-fashioned. John had two sons. John Junior and Benjamin, and two daughters, Martha and Robin. Junior and Martha were both married and had two kids each. Martha lived with her family in the, wait for this, out back, and I was all agog to hear about her life. Perhaps it wasn't exactly Neville Shute. Things must have progressed, but if you live on a hundreds of acres ranch out in the back of beyond. Then flying doctors and such like are bound to be part of your life. 
It was too fascinating. Junior lived in Sydney and often dropped in on his parents. He was a professional electrician and plumber. But it seems he drove up to work in his own Mercedes SUV. So he was obviously making good moolah. Junior loves it when people try to do a complicated job themselves, John wrote. Most of them don't even have the tools, let alone the skills for the job. His toolboxes are his most precious possessions. He has one for plumbing and a separate one for the electrical. If Ben or I want to borrow something, he gets snooty and prefers to do the job himself rather than let us savages touch his precious tools. Which is what we would have wanted in the first place, but were too sneaky to ask. He's damn efficient and highly capable and he charges a king's ransom, though not us, of course. He keeps his family in style and owns his own home. So it's no use being superior about him, George. This is a different country with different norms and customs. He certainly had my number there. I felt properly admonished. Plumbers didn't get much respect or much money here. But since I'd never fixed a leaking tap or changed a fuse in my life, I shouldn't be the one to sneer. My wife, Perry, often joked that I held the torch while she re-threaded the fuses in the middle of the night. And I always maintained she was damn lucky I even held the torch for her. Good thing we have the automatic fuse things now, like a switch they are. Let me not misrepresent myself. I don't have certain life skills. John had worked a number of jobs but finally ended up running his own bar. Not, I admit, a most honourable profession. Nevertheless, I don't think I could have taken such a risk. A steady monthly salary was more my style. Even though one would think cash would just flow in as the booze flowed out, especially in Australia, where even daytime drinking was so normal. Yet every business has risk, and it seemed John had made a go of his. Strangely, none of his kids had been interested in running it. Well, I suppose they all had their own careers. So finally, he'd sold out to a young couple, though he still went in a few hours every evening. I loved that place, he wrote. I'll always love it. With the fine dark wood and gleaming metal fixtures, I love standing behind that solid wood counter and wiping it till it's smooth and dry. I love polishing the glasses and setting them out in orderly rows all gleaming and glinting as they catch the light. The range and variety of the stacked bottles, they are my pride and joy. And the customers, the regulars and the walk-ins, you need to be a bit of a philosopher to enjoy this kind of work. People unburden themselves to a barman. He's safe. The way he spoke about that bar made me wistful. It was so wonderful that he could still go back. It kept him in touch with the most meaningful part of his life. For myself, I'd retired after numerous extensions and that was it. I had no connection with the main work of my life anymore. I pottered around a bit, but it didn't engage my whole mind or my heart or my passions. I almost felt jealous that John could have this pleasure every day. His grandkids were a constant source of joy to him, as mine were to me. Since John Jr. lived close by, he met those kids often, not Martha's though. They connected over Skype, and though it was regular, even frequent, it's not the same as a tight hug or even a personal chat. The computer's a barrier to people our age. We learn to deal with it, but we never completely forget it's there, watching and recording everything forever and ever. Sometime last year, when Junior's family was over for Sunday lunch, we were reminiscing about how his boys learned to ride their bicycles. They had trainer wheels, but they were still scared. 
especially Jem, the older one. So I held on to the back of his bike and ran with him down the driveway. He'd never know when I peeled off and he was on his own. And the first time he noticed it, he was furious with me. When I told him he'd already done about a dozen solo rides, he got all puffed up with pride and wanted to try it completely on his own. Came a cropper, didn't he? And mad as a wet hen he was at me. But I made him get up, dust himself off and try again. And before he knew it, he was whizzing around on the bike as if he'd been born on it. I'd send John photos of my family, but he didn't seem to know how to send images by email. And so I hadn't seen any of his pictures. He was proud of his Ben too, who was a university professor. But I think Robin, his youngest, was his favorite. I found it odd how he'd so completely lost touch with Jennifer though. I wasn't going to probe, but I can admit to being curious. She was his elder sister and she'd been kind to him growing up and to me, seeing as how we were together most of the time. It was decidedly odd. And so the two of us were slowly bringing each other up to date with our lives and I'd been thoroughly enjoying reconnecting with my old buddy again. And then, as I started to say earlier, I got an email from Jennifer. Dear George, John passed away last week. I hadn't seen him in ages, but they had a number to contact me at. I learned that recently he'd been in touch with someone from India and that it had made him very happy, so I checked his emails. Imagine my surprise when I discovered it was you. I've been reading your exchange of mails this last weekend. That sounds terribly officious, I realize as I type it. But perhaps you'll understand when I explain. In Australia, my always mischievous brother John had turned into a drunken derelict. He didn't do a decent day's work in his life and he used and abused and tricked every family member, including even my girls, and exhausted all the stores of love and affection we had for him. We finally cut off contact with him for good. He brought nothing but tears and shame to my parents and they died mistakenly blaming themselves for failing him. I've been paying a social worker a weekly stipend to provision him. Nothing was ever given to him new. He would sell it for money for drink even if he hadn't eaten in a week. I cannot express the shame and sorrow I feel detailing all this sordid stuff to you. His emails were a total bunch of lies. It was a completely fabricated world, peopled with characters who never existed, except perhaps in his mind. He could never even look after himself, let alone a wife and four kids. And his make-believe business would have to have been a bar, since that was probably the only world he knew. Though the one he painted for you was as far out of his reach even as a customer as the moon. But I got a glimpse of my brother, the orderly thinker, the passionate life lover, the engaging and friendly fellow he used to be that I haven't seen in ages. Into those mails he poured perhaps the whole of his frustrated hopes and ambitions for himself and his dreams for what might have been. You can never know what a wonderful thing you did for him, George. You believed him. And so you gave John a chance to remake himself in an image he wanted, unburdened by the torment and misery he'd created for himself and for all of us, yet without the need to actually have the strength and discipline to see it through. You gave him a chance to be happy. And you gave him a shot at dignity, false though it was. I can never thank you enough for that. My good wishes to your brother and sister and all your family. You were the one I remember the most from the old days in India. 
You two were such a pair of wicked rascals. I'm glad to hear that you've all prospered. Thank you for remembering me. My two girls are doing very well, both married and with kids of their own, settled in stable jobs and relationships. John has made me appreciate stability a great deal. I can hardly believe that inside the shambling derelict that he had become, there was still the beautiful John of old. And you gave him back to me, even if only at second hand. For that, you will be blessed in my prayers forever. With warm regards, fond memories and undying gratitude, Jennifer Lawson, nay Brady. What can I say? I have no words to say to that. But that's the true story of my friend, John. High drama in the ladies loo They were an old gang college mates and others added over the years all used to each other for a good long time The peachy faced honey was a fresh transplant Nanda's new bride She'd heard about them all from Nanda even met them at the wedding but she didn't know them as she'd known her own friends they sat at a small table littered with many half filled bowls of fries and salted nuts and glasses emptied to varying degrees chairs were crammed around and everyone contributed vociferously and often simultaneously to the discussions honey was the only one who didn't weigh in Her shining eyes flew from one to the other. They spoke on subjects she didn't know much of, politics and sport and travel. She was a bit younger than them, the first spouse to enter the group and from another city, too many points of distance. They were too damn witty and needled each other constantly. Everyone was the butt of some joke and no one seemed to take the blindest bit of umbrage. They laughed as heartily as the others and redirected the barb elsewhere. Could she ever be that coolly nonchalant? Nanda leaned back and put his arm around her. She smiled happily into his face. I'm still getting used to your friends. Chill, Nanda. He squeezed her shoulder and in a moment was back with his elbows on the table going hell for leather with someone about something to do with taxation. She was 4 years younger than the youngest of them and 6 years younger than Nanda and none of her friends ever talked of things like this it was going to be exciting The group rallied around and made place at the crowded table for one more Preeti They plowed into her for being late but she waved it off coolly her ruby lips and pearly teeth a stark contrast to her plain black dress She had a very animated face and when she walked into a room every other woman immediately felt dowdy Honey felt it too Her lovely dress part of her trousseau still shining with newness felt irrelevant The air came surging out of the cushion she'd been plumped up on all evening Her hands picked at the tiny seed pearls on her evening bag and she bristled for the first time that evening when nanda maneuvered his chair to make place for the newcomer she was evidently the darling of the group it wasn't anything she herself did or said but the others treated her so including she noticed jealously nanda he introduced honey to her and they smiled at each other and pressed fingers across the width of nanda's body 
But Honey's heart wasn't in that smile. She instinctively didn't like this one, especially as the pretty Preeti held her eyes gently and expressed the hope that they'd be good friends. Hypocrite, Honey thought. It's not my friendship she's interested in. The evening sped on, with more drinks and food coming and going with predictable regularity. The pretty Preeti had an obnoxious habit of touching people when she spoke, Honey noticed. She laid her slender fingers with their red-tipped talons on Nanda's arm when she interrupted him to make her own point. And through Honey's suddenly green, green eyes, she was a blot on the evening. She didn't appreciate her wit or her humour. She didn't like her simple elegance. She didn't care that she hardly ate or drank anything. She hated the fact that she was sitting on the other side of Nanda and wished that instead of coming late, she hadn't come at all. Honey lost touch with the ebb and flow of the banter across the salted peanuts. Twice she caught the gaze of one of the other girls across the table. She'd responded with a smile twice already. Now what could she do? She didn't want to look like a dumb doll, never talking or saying anything intelligent in all this flurry of conversation and only smiling like an idiot. So she avoided her glance, but she still felt its warmth on her occasionally. Nanda, whom she'd importuned a half dozen times not to worry about her, was now actually not worrying about her, and that was causing her further disgruntlement. And she blamed that on Preeti too. A discreet glance at her wrist told her it had been over two hours since they'd arrived. She decided to make a temporary breakaway. She whispered something to Nanda, who waved his arm vaguely towards some dark part of the room. As she scraped back her chair, her eyes fell upon those blood-tipped claws resting on Nanda's shirt sleeve and an angry tide rose within her. The other woman, the gentle one across the table, indicated she'd join her and Honey fought to get her temper under control. No need for everyone to know how the pretty Preeti had got under her skin. I'm Nelly, in case you missed my name, she said kindly, and Honey felt a flood of warmth towards her for understanding. Nelly knew her way about and led Honey confidently to the ladies' loo. An old attendant snored gently in a corner, and the two girls looked at each other and giggled companionably. The night was still young, but evidently too old for that poor thing. Nelly was chatting on in a friendly way and Honey was smoothing her dress, checking it in the full-length mirror, front and back, and thinking how nice it was to have started making a friend so soon, when Nelly said, totally out of context with her previous sentence about the difficulty of getting a good dressmaker, Don't worry about Preeti, my dear. I can see you don't like her, but I'll make sure Nanda is safe, and you too. I'll take care of everything. Men can be a bit foolish about women sometimes, and Nanda more than others. But I've known him a long time, and I'll set him straight. This was exactly what she'd feared, seeing that scarlet woman and her too easy behaviour with her husband. But thinking something, however scandalous, and having it said aloud, are two very different things. She was shocked at Nelly's implications, and terrified at what that meant for her marriage. What do you mean, Nelly? she said, trying to be strong. I saw nothing improper. All of you are old friends. True, quoth Nelly. But did you see me squeezing in between the men, or leaning forward in that provocative way, or laying my hands possessively on any of them? That's Preeti and her sleazy way with all men, married or unmarried and especially Nanda. She always had her sights on him. But I told you, don't worry. I'm here and I'll keep Nanda tight and true to you. She looked insistently into Honey's eyes and held her shaky hands hotly in her own, making Honey very uncomfortable. Honey pulled away and opened a tap and ran her hands under the stream of cool water, patting her flushed face. Even if Preeti was as predatory as Nelly said she was, 
How shameful to have given such an impression to a virtual stranger that her barely a month old marriage was already on the skids. You must be mistaken, Nelly. I wasn't thinking anything like that. And besides, Nanda and I love each other and I don't doubt him. Nelly sneered a little meanly. Men will be men, darling. Grow up. And Honey didn't like the sound of that at all and it really got her back up. That may be true, but it's also true that Nanda is Nanda and he's a good man, she stated as sternly as she could, intensely disliking the tone of Nelly's insinuations. Mercifully, the loo door burst open. But it was Preeti herself who barged in and Honey's words hung heavily in the uncomfortable silence. Hostility flowed in a triangle, with everyone raging silently at someone and the attendant's rhythmic snores the only sound in the silence. Nelly moved in next to Honey and put her arm around her shoulders. Honey froze. What on earth had she precipitated with her stupid jealousy? She heard Nanda's voice calling through the door. Is she okay, Preeti? Oh God, Honey, are you all right? And she would have run to him, her only safe port in this crazy storm, if Preeti hadn't been standing in front of the door with those scarlet-tipped hands on her hips, looking strangely fierce, eyes flicking between Nelly and Honey. Honey and Nelly. What poison have you been dripping into her ears? Preeti snapped at Nelly, her eyes sharp and narrow with anger and all the laughter gone from her voice. She's married now. And he's chosen her, and that's the end of that. You had your chance, but he wasn't interested, and you have to accept that. Honey felt the arm drop from off her shoulder, and a brief sideways glance almost caused her knees to buckle. The kind face had dropped like a mask, and Nellie's teeth glinted diamond hard as she bit out an expletive. Bloody do good up, Preeti. A few more minutes and I'd have messed her up completely and that would have put pay to any silly notions of marital bliss. You really should learn not to interfere in other people's business, Miss Goody Two-Shoes. And picking up her handbag and pushing past Preeti, she flounced out of the loo with a furious toss of her head. Honey was on the verge of collapse and Preeti had her in her arms in a trice, the red-tipped fingers no longer talons, but lifelines to cling to. She had Honey safe in a chair even before Nanda could come charging into the ladies, wailing that he'd never have thought Nelly would stoop so low. He was down on his haunches in front of Honey, looking entreatingly into her face, begging her forgiveness for exposing her to such an ugly situation. He hadn't noticed that Nelly had followed her. Thank God Preeti had seen and felt uneasy enough to point it out to him. It was all his fault and on and on and on until his insistent male voice finally punctured the slumbers of the attendant and she started shrieking that gents not allowed here sir honey gazed around still a bit shocked but suddenly just cracked up at the ridiculousness of the situation she still reeling from her spectacular lack of judgment nanda at her feet and overflowing with contrite wordiness Preeti standing beside them both like a pillar of strength and the loo attendant shrieking her head off at Nanda to please leave ladies' room, sir, or I call security. Nanda quietened her with a fistful of goodies from his wallet and turned around to receive a playful smack from Honey. That's for being disloyal to me. The fact that you didn't know me then is no excuse and the fact that you may or may not have reciprocated her feelings here, Nanda crossed his hands over his chest. Never, never, never ask any of them, he insisted earnestly. But that's still no excuse, Honey berated him and whacked him playfully with her beaded handbag while Preeti gurgled with laughter and the old woman counted her pickings and tucked them away discreetly. They were still joking and teasing when the door inched open and it was one of the boys. We are holding off a half dozen angry women outside here. So if you guys have quite finished your private party, we'd appreciate it if you'd kindly take the laughter outside. 
They scrambled out of the loo and back to the table, Honey's hand firmly gripped in Nanda's and her heart secure again too. Everyone sat down, but this time, Honey patted the chair next to her as she looked gratefully up at Preeti. My gosh, had she got the bull by the tail? Phew! And I didn't know Samson very well. Our acquaintance was mostly professional though we'd shared a few drinks at a pub once. He'd been a decent chap to work with, and he certainly hadn't looked particularly prone to keel over and die. So I was sitting here at his funeral, partly as a tip of the hat to a colleague, and partly in introspection of my own mortality. Like Samson, I also was a bit grey, a bit better filled out than I ought to be, and more than a bit stressed and overworked. I'm sure there were many others in the gathering who were, like me, selfishly thinking, what are my chances of getting knocked out of the game like that? Poof! Gone! Quite a squirm-inducing thought, earning me indignant glances from my perfectly quaffed and attired neighbour, whose funeral etiquette was apparently much stricter than my own. I offered her an apologetic glance, but she was not so easily mollified. I decided I'd better turn my attentions to the proceedings. And with perfect timing, just as the cleric was finishing his bit. I'm not much of a churchman, but I confess to enjoying the trappings whenever I do drop in. The flowers, the candles, the paintings and statuary in the better establishments the grand and lofty architecture, and most delightfully, the music. Church organists and choirs can be extremely accomplished, and one doesn't have to be a strictly denominational believer to be inspired by the music and to have one's heart rejoiced by the rolling splendor of sound. I was still awash in that glorious flood of music, when we progressed to the eulogies. Samson's brother, I deduced who he was from his remarks. A son, a granddaughter who read out a tender poem she'd written, followed by a fusty, grey-haired, black-suited man bowed with age. Wait a minute, not that old, now that I could see his face. He stood at the lectern and rested the weary weight of the world on it before he took a deep, shuddering breath and lifted his eyes to the congregation. And immediately I recognized him, though I'd only seen him once before and in very different circumstances. I remember the occasion unmistakably, but the change in him was so phenomenal that I was amazed I'd identified him at all. He was a rack of his former self, and listening to the eulogy, it appeared it was the death of Samson that had caused the devastation. That was astounding enough just by itself. But the incongruity of such grief when related to our last meeting was much more astounding even than that. I know I'll have to explain things better or you just won't understand. I'd mentioned that I'd had an evening in a pub with Samson once. That's the time I met this chap. I'm going to call him Fred, for convenience, since I have no idea what his name is. Samson and I were putting our best efforts towards drowning the harshness of an unwarranted chewing out by a singularly uncivil customer. I was facing the pub entrance and saw Fred enter. He was physically nondescript, for which he made up with a hugely exaggerated swagger. 
Samson had his back to him, which back was soundly thwacked by Fred. What followed was so shocking and so suddenly over and everything returned to normal that I half wondered if it had actually occurred. Out of Fred's reedy little mouth and from under his wispy moustache, the invective flowed in an almost unabated torrent. Above the hubbub and the fumes in the pub, the words tumbled thickly onto Samson's head and shoulders. Considering the harshness of the language, he was not a whit put out and stayed seated comfortably and listened companionably to the tirade, even unbelievably nodding agreeably. I was so mortally incensed at Fred's vitriol and at Samson's composure that I almost weighed in myself with the old one-two. I could detect no hint of what exactly Samson had done to infuriate Fred. It seemed Fred's intention was simply to vilify him. Various unflattering allusions were made to his relationships with sundry members of his family. Even from these veiled for the sake of propriety remarks, you will observe that Fred was quite unbridled. In the face of this, Samson's attitude was bewildering. Fred's river of gall finally ran itself dry. At which point, Samson took up the task himself, though for a much shorter duration and with far less aggression. It was a mere token response and did nothing, in my opinion, to gather the ragged shreds of dignity around himself. At the end of this pathetic attempt at a return swipe, and I assure you this is true, the two bumped fists like boxers in a ring. And Fred moved on his merry way through the pub. And Samson turned to me with a wry grin, raised his glass of beer and took a long, thirsty swallow. And that was it. Not a word of explanation or vindication. Just carried on as before, as if the whole interlude hadn't happened at all. Cutting back to the present, that vituperative little turkey cock was transformed into this shambling wreck of a human being. His whole body, his stance, his gait, the droop of his shoulders, the lifeless dangle of his arms, the listless gaze into nothingness and the seemingly rudderless movement. These told a story of a fathomless grief. In spite of the scene I had witnessed, this was not guilt. It was a kind of primeval, bone-searing sadness, which was so awesome to behold. It made a veritable giant of this poor, broken spirit. His body radiated his agony to the vaulted ceilings of the cavernous church and it rang with his soundless cries. It was a while before I could even listen to his words. So moved was I. And so unbalanced by the discrepancy between my two images of the man. I made an effort to concentrate and things began to become clearer. Fred, as he will always be to me now, and Samson had been childhood friends, the best of buddies. And Samson's unannounced departure had torn a chunk out of Fred's life and he had no idea how he was to continue to function. He'd not yet adjusted to the amputation. The violent verbal duel I'd seen had been an old game between them, it turned out. A tender restatement of their mutual loyalty. It involved creeping up unannounced on one another and pounding home the point by having uninterrupted abusing rights. It was a point of solidarity between them, never to make explanation to any inadvertent witness, including, as you know, myself. I watched Samson make his final journey, leaving the church on black-robed shoulders. Fred walked behind him in a daze, automatically following his friend, hardly aware that he couldn't so easily follow where Samson had gone. 
the sincerity of the little unassuming fellow, his evident wretchedness and his valiant though utterly futile attempt to play it down was unspeakably moving to witness. As I cast my eye out of the church, past the black-clad cortege and onto the somber coffin, my abiding thought was, Wow! It must be something to have a friendship like that. Lucky man, Samson. Even if he was dead, 